Welcome to Anlo Park Church's online worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Father, O oh God most high, who dwells in the highest of heavens, we praise you. Father, O oh Lord most exalted, beyond our thoughts and imaginations, we praise you. Our great high priest has gone before, has entered into the Holy of Holies, and has opened up a way for us to follow. In his name, we too would enter into your eternal presence, for he is our priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. To him be all praise, together with you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit, one Lord, the same in every age. Amen. Well, hello, everybody. It's so good to have you here for the children's story. Our story today deals with something that is in Hebrews 5, 1 through 10, and it's the same scripture that uh, I will be reading from later and Pastor Sue will be speaking from. It deals with perfection. Now, before I came, you know, just like the rest of us, I had my mask took it off in order to tell this children's story here from afar. And um, I kind of like my mask. It's black, it's got peppers on it. It's the same material I used last year at Camp Colorado when we had a Mexican theme one night, and I made an apron out of this, all the little hot peppers. So it's kind of a cool mask. Uh, and it looks pretty nice from a distance, but you know what? If you look at it close up, well, I'm just glad the camera's not that close. Some of the stitching is not that good. 
And when my stitching isn't that good, I always think back of 4-H. Some of you know what that is, don't you? 4-H, that club you can do lots of, thi lots of things in. When I was in fifth grade, I joined 4-H, and I did sewing and cooking. And one of the things that just bugged me while I was there is everything had to be perfect. I mean, we didn't just get to cut out a piece of fabric, do something. We had to pull a thread out of it so we'd have a nice straight line to cut. We had to cut the patterns out before we could pin them on. And you know what? When we got to the end of a stitch with a machine, we didn't just get to go back and forth. No, we had to stop, cut the thread, pull out the thread so it's on both sides the same, tie knots. Yeah, we were supposed to be perfect. Now, I never got perfect, so I didn't get a purple ribbon at the fair ever at the Sand and Sage Roundup in Lamar, Colorado. But I usually got a blue ribbon, so despite all the hard work and not getting quite perfect, I really actually got very, very good because we had encouragement. Um, our leaders and our parents would encourage us to you know, rip it out again, try once more, and yeah, I got to be pretty good. Perfect, no. And this kind of makes me think of people. You know, is it really possible for me to ever get perfect? How about for a kid? What would it be like to become a perfect kid? Is it even possible to become a perfect kid or a perfect adult? Well, we know that's not true, right? Because we're human beings and we make mistakes. Sometimes we think bad things. We want to do things that maybe we shouldn't. Sometimes we get angry. We might even hurt any somebody. Yeah, you guys probably don't do that, but I've done that before. Or we try to maybe draw a perfect picture or something, and it just never quite turns out the way we think in our imagination it should be. But that's okay, because most of us will never be perfect, whether it's as a personality or whether it's sewing or woodworking or, you know, whatever we try to do. But we keep doing our best, don't we? And uh, the important thing is, is that we don't get too hard on, our, on ourselves and that we just, you know, kind of feel miserable because sometimes we just make mistakes. Sometimes things don't turn out the way we want. Sometimes they turn out a lot better, right? Well, Jesus came along. And this is now where it ties into our scripture today. He came to live with us on earth, didn't he? And he was tempted, and he had some bad experiences, too. He had some times that were very hard. But you know what? In Hebrews 5, verse 9, it says, He was made perfect. The Bible teaches us that only God is perfect. Yep, we're never going to get there, folks. We might get close, but we're never going to get there. So you know what we do in the meantime? We work hard. We do our best. And just remember, as human beings, we do make mistakes sometimes. We have to be kind to ourselves because God is there, and he forgives us, and he encourages us, and our families do that. So it may not ever win a purple ribbon at the fair, but it's good because I've really worked hard on it, and I think that's all that anybody can expect of us. Thank you for listening this morning. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day. Enjoy the sunshine. Go outside. See God's creation. Allow us time today to study your word, to be with us. Be with those suffering, Lord. Be with those missing of our community. Be with the community of Lincoln, Lord. Help us to keep being a blessing. Pray especially for Harry and Lois Marie and the White and Cup family, Lord. Be with all those that are suffering due to COVID, the shutdowns. Be with our students as they get ready for school again, Lord. Help protect us. Help us know the best way forward for this church body so that we can be your hands and feet. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading today is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 14, 
through chapter 5, verse 10. Jesus, the great high priest. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Count well the cost, Christ Jesus says, when you lay the foundation. Are you resolved, though also lost, to risk your reputation? Your health, your wealth, for Christ the Lord, as you now give your solemn word. Oh, as you now give your solemn word, show us another way. Show us another way. Show us another way. Till we grow up in godly grace, show us another way. Show 
us another way. joke. A priest, a pastor, and a rabbi meet weekly in an interfaith meeting. One afternoon, one made a comment that preaching to people isn't all that hard. The real challenge would be to preach to a bear. So they decided to conduct their own experiment, go out into the woods, preach to a bear, and attempt to convert it. Two days later, they're all at a hospital discussing their experiment. Father Flannery, with his arm in a sling and on crutches, says, I found a bear, and I read to him from the catechism. Well, he wanted nothing to do with me, began to slap me around. So I grabbed my holy water, and I sprinkled him, and holy mother of God, he became as gentle as a lamb. The bishop is coming next week to give him his first communion. Reverend Billy Bob spoke next. Now, he's in a wheelchair with an arm and a leg and a cast. And he said, well, brothers, as you know, we don't sprinkle. So I read to my bearer from God's holy word, and he tried to slap me. So I wrestled him down a hill into a creek, and I quickly dunked him and baptized his hairy soul. He became as gentle as a lamb, and then we spent the rest of the day praising Jesus. They both looked down at the rabbi, who's in a hospital bed in a full body cast with an IV in. He was in bad shape. He looked up and said, looking back on it, circumcision might not have been the way to start. Well, the titles pastor, minister, reverend, priest, and even rabbi and imam have very similar meanings today. A minister is is ordained to be a preacher of the gospel, but doesn't necessarily have the same duties over a group of believers as a pastor does. The word pastor comes from the Greek word poimen, which literally means shepherd, and is related to another word we know, pasture. So pastors are seen as a guide, a shepherd, providing spiritual care and nurture to those entrusted to him or her and also ordained to preach the gospel, much like a minister is. And a reverend is more of a title and can be used interchangeably or in addition to pastor. Well, rabbi literally means teacher in Jewish circles, as we often hear about when discussing Jesus' title today. Rabbis lead Jewish congregations just as a pastor does in a Christian community now, though. And imams are leaders of Muslim congregations. I've always heard that a priest, only in the Catholic tradition, but it's also used in Greek Orthodox and Anglican traditions, and is a title that means they can perform the sacraments as well as lead a church. I always thought that Catholics saw this as people as an intercessor between God and them, needed in order for their confessions to count and to tell someone what penance must be done, like Ten Hail Marys, and they're needed to bless the bread and the wine. But the word priest has its origins in the Greek word presbyteros and the Latin word presbyter. It essentially means elder. Catholic priests must be celibate. Anglicans, one can marry. And Greek Orthodox priests can only marry if they're married before they get ordained. And out of these three, only Anglican priests can be women. 
And as we know, some Protestant denominations allow women pastors while others still do not. Just some interesting facts for you regarding the different titles given to those leading believers. <clears throat> In biblical times, Jewish priests were only from the tribe of Levi, called the Levites. This was due to instructions received from God to Moses on Mount Sinai, along with the Ten Commandments. Aaron, Moses' brother, was the first high priest. Levi was Moses' and Aaron's great-grandfather and was the founder of the Levites. And Levi was one of Jacob's sons. In the book of Exodus, you'll find that Levi had three sons, one being Kohath, then Amran, and he and a woman named Jochebed were the parents of Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. It's interesting to study the genealogies, and interestingly, the Jewish tradition still traces the ethnicity of the Levites, called the Kohanim. Yet rabbis do not need to be part of this tribe. The offices of rabbi and priest were distinct in biblical days. Priests were the descendants of Aaron, as we stated, and they worked in the temple. Though in Jesus' day, there were so many of them that they didn't work through the whole year. A rabbi was a religious teacher who was operated out of the local synagogue and was not required to belong to the tribe of Levi or any particular family or tribe. Unlike priests, rabbis at that time did not receive payments. They were expected to have a secular job, such as Paul having a job as a tent maker. Rabbis and priests tended to have different theological beliefs. Most priests were members of the Sadducees, the Aristocrat, priestly party in Jerusalem, while most rabbis were Pharisees. These groups had great hostility towards each other, and yet they served together on the Sanhedrin, which was the lawmaking, the rule body of the Jews. Due to these differences, Paul was able to get that change of venue to the Roman court all interesting, but let's finally delve into some of our texts for today. Today, I'll begin changing things up a bit in our look of Hebrews, as we're looking at three different books, really. I told you last week we would be looking at the passages in Hebrews dealing with Jesus as our priest, and there are three sections of this. The first per portion is from Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16 titled, Our High Compassionate Priest. The Hebrews 4 verses are repeating some of what has been dis discussed earlier in this sermon series. We have a high priest, Jesus, who can sympathize with our weaknesses as he has been tempted and yet is sinless. And I love verse 16, often discussed in churches, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Boy, this verse has spoken to me in my life. I talked a little bit about it, what happened to us in 2009 last week. Now I'm going to be talking about just what happened in the last quarter of last year, 10 years later, in 2019. We didn't know what we were going to do for money. As my husband was leaving his jobs, and we had a weeks of an emotional roller coaster. Yet we had so many signs that God was with us. Yet I must admit, Satan had entered the picture and had me filled with anxiety more than a couple of times. I thought I might have to put my hold on ministry again and go back into teaching. We didn't know if we would be able to keep our health insurance. We had no idea how we would pay our bills past a month. And of course, put all of this on top of the worry was, was my husband going to be okay? Which of course was the main issue. So here are just a few ways of the, the ways God showed up at that time. Within the first week, we got a notice from the IRS that we were owed 
quite a bit of money back. We were assisting in knowing how we would be able to keep our health insurance the next week. Within a few more weeks, even as I had interviewed for teaching positions, my husband got a part-time offer would still hold us over, and I got offered an interim pastoral position that would keep our income high enough so that we would know we would be okay. Also in this time, I was assured that I could get help from the denomination, but we didn't need to ask for it. We could have shriveled up, kept going crazy, but we did have the whereabouts to come to the Lord boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, because God is good all the time. Let's move to the Hebrews 5 text. Maybe verse 1 is why the Catholic Church used to have indulgences where people had to give money for their sins. One of the things that Martin Luther protested against in his 95 thesis during the Reformation. But these verses are affirming the law found in Exodus and Leviticus and saying that God calls one to be a priest as Aaron was. I like that it describes a priest as one who has compassion and yet is subject to weakness. Yet I still struggle to see why he discusses sacrifices for and gifts for sins. But you see, but the next part talks about that. But the next part is the but statement in that. Verses 5 to 11 explain that we don't need to have an intercessor besides Jesus anymore. It says, Christ was called by God when he said, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and you are a priest forevermore. We will get to the Melchizedek in a minute, so just bear with me. Look at verse 7. During the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers with tears to him who could save him. His father, the almighty God in heaven, much more than flesh. And it says he was heard due to his fear. He had complete reverence for God, even though he had the power of God. And his prayers were heard, maybe not as he wished. Yet he was obedient and suffered. Look at verse 8. It says he learned obedience by his sufferings. Wow, what a different way to think about sufferings, right? Sometimes we can become closer to God due to our sufferings. When we cling to his promises, when we're brought to our knees, when we just do the next right thing and trust, we're learning obedience due to our sufferings. It's hard to remember that or even believe in it in the midst of it. But we'll discuss perseverance next month and look at that a bit more. Then there will be a great promise, also something we'll discuss further next month when we discuss the promises of Hebrews. But verse 9 says he became perfected and is the author of salvation to all those who obey him. Then here comes that phrase, verse 10, that says he was called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Let us look a bit deeper at who Melchizedek is in order to understand why the author of Hebrews discusses him at great length, especially in the final passage from Hebrews 7. You may or may not know this about the character of Melchizedek, but let's look at some interesting things related to him. First, the name. Names can have important meanings. We named our first son Sean because we wanted a name starting with S. And Sean is an Irish version of John, meaning gift from God. Our last name, Smith, means that someone somewhere in my husband's ancestry made something with his hands. 
Some people are named after people, even biblical characters. Well, Melchizedek is an old Canaanite name, literally meaning king of righteousness. Melchi means king, and Zedek means righteousness. First, let's look at the first mention of Melchizedek, found in Genesis 14. Remember, this was written about 2000 BC, so about 4,000 years ago. Then he is mentioned again in Psalm 110, 110 written about 2000, 2000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, sorry, in 1000 BC. And then here in Hebrews, written around 1900 to 2000 years ago. Some believe Melchizedek is a theophany, Jesus actually coming to earth as recorded. But some believe he was a pagan king of a real place. But if you look at the text, it does not portray him as a pagan. I tend to believe another theory, that he was an actual king and a priest, but not by the order of Levi, pointing to Christ. As remember, Genesis was written 2,000 years, 2,000 BC, and the Levitical system of priests wasn't set up for another 700 years. In Genesis 14, Lot is taken captive, and Abraham goes with an army to rescue him. In verse 14, or sorry, 18, it says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, met with Abraham and the king of Sodom and brought out bread and wine. It says he was a priest of the God Most High, that this title was the true God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham. Verse 19 and 20, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abram gives him one-tenth of everything. Now, Salem means peace. Maybe it's a title, but most kings in Genesis are kings of places. We're not yet sure, really, if Salem was a real priest. Maybe it's meant as a parallel for Zion, as stated in Psalm 76, too. So some believe it's the same as Jerusalem. But look at all the allusions to Jesus in this passage. He brings out wine and bread. He is called the king of righteousness, Melchizedek, and he's the king of a place that means peace. I love what I heard in one message from White Mike Winger on his series about finding Jesus in the Old Testament. He says scripture is showing us Jesus long before Jesus came. He says Jesus is the perfection of what is shown to us here as righteousness, justice, and peace and mercy meet on the cross. Okay, back to Genesis. Melchizedek acknowledges that God has been with Abraham in battle and helped him from his enemies. This text is reiterated in Hebrews 7, verses 1 and 2. And there is a summary of the Genesis text, see? So this is interesting. This king blesses Abraham, and Abraham turns around and ties to him, giving him 10% of everything he had. Verse 3 gives another clue, not often found in Scripture regarding Melchizedek, because there's no genealogical record of him. There's only two passages that have people that had no genealogical record, and he is one of them. It even says as he is without beginning or end. Another allusion to Jesus. Then it says he resembles the Son of God and is a priest forever. So it doesn't say he is Jesus or God. It says he resembles him. So in my opinion, his genealogical record has been omitted from Scripture for a divine purpose initiated from God so that we could point to one who is like Christ and find resemblances of him to come in the New Testament. 
Then it says in verse 4, we're in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 4, that even the great part patriarch tithed his spoils to him. You see, the one who receives is greater. The one who blesses is greater. But here's another picture of Jesus, right? One greater is the one that gives. The one that is a descendant of the priest of Israelites. Normally, he would be considered greater. But he flips the script, right? Here he is the one who receives a blessing and yet gives to another. So Melchizedek is a priest before the priesthood was even established. That's why we keep hearing a priest to the, in the order of Melchizedek. It's also a picture of how Jesus opened the gates, grafted in those with faith to the chosen people, the Gentiles. And remember, he himself was from the tribe of, of Judah. So people had to know to look for someone maybe not from the tribe of Levi as their next high priest. As we see here, Melchizedek wasn't even a Jew, yet he's referred to as a high priest, and four texts say the Lord is a priest after his order. Now let me interrupt for one look at Hebrews 7 to go to another scripture that we find of Melchizedek found in Psalm 110. This is a short psalm, only seven verses, and it's titled Assurance of Victory for God's Priest King. We discussed this psalm two weeks ago as Hebrews 1 quoted from two verses where God says, I will make you ruler and your enemies will be your footstool. In fact, this psalm is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. Jesus even quotes it, stumping the Pharisees in Matthew 22. It's quoted again in Acts 2, Mark 12, and Luke 20. This is because it's a messianic psalm, and the Jews knew it. Verses 3 and 4 say, Your people will offer themselves willingly. On the day you lead your forces on the holy mountains, from the womb of the morning like dew, your youth will come to you. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Here it is again, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So for a moment, let me return to our thoughts about pastors and priests. Priests and pastors help people in their relationship with God, learning more how to study, how to learn tools to help with spiritual disciplines like prayer, and devotional time to get closer to God, and they assist people to think about issues regarding sin. And this is stay, saying Jesus can do all those things and who's with us. He's always interceding on our behalf and helping us not only with grace and mercy, but showing and drawing us to a closer relationship with the divine and transforming us to be more Christ-like. Did you know the Mormon church actually has a system of Melchizedekian priesthood, which is greater of the two systems of pre priesthoods in Mormonism? But it's not hard to believe, as this is what cults tend to do. They take tough passages and build a whole theological system around these verses. We have to be students of the word to know enough. I might not understand that fully, but I don't think it says all that. In fact, it's not biblical to me to even say we should try to be priests in the order of Melchizedek. What's found in the text is that there's only one that follows and only one that's needed, Jesus. So let me end with some summary statements, and you can look over the rest of the text in Hebrews 7, which I have touched on or will within these statements. Number one, the system of the law was preceded by Melchizedek, done before Jesus and saying that Jesus follows after him, before the whole purpose of the, because the whole purpose 
of the Levitical law was to draw people closer to God until Jesus came. Number two, high priests die, but Jesus' priesthood lasts forever. We don't have to say Melchizedek was Jesus, but see, it doesn't make sense without him. What do you do with Melchizedek or the promise of Psalm 110? In fact, the whole Old Testament without Jesus. The Old Testament promises a future priest over and over again. Why would you bother promising a future priest if the law was enough? It was for us to know that it was temporary. Number three, Jesus per perfected the law. The law just points out that you're not good enough without Jesus, the Messiah. Without Jesus, that whole Old Testament again fails. Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. As we see in verse 22, and we'll be looking at more closely next month as well, but no longer are animal sacrifices needed. His sacrifice ended it all. Number four, Jesus is with us and lives in us. I say this about every week, don't I? Jesus is not just praying for you like a pastor. He's constantly abiding in you, interceding for you. And lastly, number five, Jesus is a priest for all people. With Aaron, within the law, priests were picked by their hereditariness. It was in the family. And remember, Aaron's family line sometimes got burned, but Melchizedek was chosen. He's a picture of Christ and what he will do. Christ is a priest for those far and wide, for the whole world, not just for the Jews. And I'll add that he is found in unexpected places like this points to. Not in where we expect to see him. So look out for God. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for showing us images of Christ in the Old Testament and confirming them in the New, for the understanding you bring through studying your word, and for Jesus, your Son, our High Priest, the only one we'll ever need. Jesus, children of God, for he is your high priest. Tell others of what you have found in Jesus and that he is all they'll ever need.